we are live good evening everyone welcome to i focus online lecture 1 to 4 and the glaucoma session 28 today we have dr harsh kumar with us and uh, he'll be talking on lasers and glaucoma i request pradeep sir to please introduce herself uh, thank you rolika good evening everyone today dr vanita is not here so i am doing her job it is always pleasure to introduce dr harsh so he does not need any introduction he is very popular in all ophthalmic circle not only in glaucoma glaucoma specialist but still i have to do the formalities so dr Harsh has done his MBBS and MD from RP Center, New Delhi, and he did both this uh, education with a gold medal. He was then uh, a faculty in RP Center. Uh, then uh, he became additional professor of ophthalmology, and he was looking after the glaucoma unit. Then he left and joined the CFS from the very inception of the CFS. now he is a director of glaucoma services at center for sight he has more than 70 publications on his credit he was a past president of the glaucoma society of india he has several book chapters on his name and uh, he has a special interest in uh, lasers in glaucoma and he has done lots of research work on lasers in glaucoma so it will be really a pleasure to listen to dr harsh on his own topic it's all yours dr harsh thank you dr prateep that was really kind of you and uh, i must say that uh, the idea of this lecture is uh, that uh, you people not only learn about uh, the lasers for examination purpose because the basic idea is that this is for post graduates but i know that a whole lot of other people also join so when you are alone in your opds and in your clinics then maybe you can use some of these procedures which are very very popular and some which are not so popular so please try and listen so that uh, you can use them on your patients and benefit them so i will start my screen share So are we good? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, laser, as all of you would know, is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, where you get a very strong monochromatic, unidirectional, coherent light. Uh, is my sound good enough, Doctor Pratik? Ah, uh, very much, very much. You are very clear. Okay, thank Lights you. Lights are visible. Fantastic. Please go ahead. Yeah. So uh, there are various kind of lasers. The gas lasers, which we all know, the argon, tritium, helium, neon, carbon dioxide, the solid state ND YAG, which we so commonly use, and then the excimer laser, which is so popular nowadays. So what is the mechanism? Uh, maybe nobody will ask you. Maybe somebody may just ask you. So the ND YAG, which is the most popular laser that we use for glaucoma, is a photo disruptive laser. Means a very strong energy is concentrated in a very small spot in a very small time. So what happens is the atoms are stripped of their electrons, and the ions which are formed actually form a plasma. So they form the fourth state of matter, and because of this disruption. there is a uh, there is a plasma formation and therefore the tissues get ruptured so uh, and the other common thing that actually i will try and instill in, in you is also to use some of the photocoagulative lasers and uh, the basic idea in this the like the argon which you use for prp so commonly is the one in which actually the light energy gets converted uh, and denaturizes the proteins over there in the local tissues so there is a charring so these are the things that we commonly use there are number of others that we are not so commonly using we use it in all cases open angle angle closure secondary glaucoma as well so this is the common laser that we use that is the 
acute switch to NDI, some people may ask you the wavelength, which is 1064 nanometer. So somebody may fool you and ask you that what is, uh, uh, there's also a 532 Q switch P green laser. So that is a frequency double laser. And the moment the frequency, the wavelength is 532 nanometer, that means it's a coagulative laser, okay? So 1064 nanometer is the photodisruptive YAG laser. The energy that we use is 0.3 to 10 millijoules, depending upon what we want per pulse. And you can have multiple pulses coming together, what we know as burst mode. The spot size is around 8 microns and there is a cone angle, the angle at which this is spread out. Uh, and there is a very important aspect that is known as the posterior or the anterior offset, which means that uh, since this is a colorless laser, we focus it with a helium neon beam. And that, that beam, if we focus it slightly posteriorly so that the laser is actually going posterior to where the beam is being uh, centered like we use in posterior capsulotomy so that we don't injure the posterior uh, the lens per se. So that is a posterior focal shift. If we are doing the anterior sweeping of the lens, then we do an anterior focal shift so that the laser is not spoiling the thing. Only the plasma formation which occurs is affecting the tissues which, are, which we are dealing with. So this is what I was trying to tell you. So you have a Heaney beam, which is helium neon beam, uh, around 800, uh, this thing, wavelength, which actually has four or three or two spots, depending on the machine. When you put it as one, that is the place where the laser will fire. So what are the possible questions? Because iridotomy is something that all of your teachers would have done or would have seen and would know about and would ask you, because that is the most common glaucoma procedure. Should all angle closure go undergo iridotomy? What is the pre-laser preparation for PI? What lens, what laser is required for peripheral iridotomy? What are the settings? What site? What should be the size? What is the commonest complication? And what are the post-laser medications? So during this time, I'm going to spend the most time on this and try to sort this out. So as far as the lasers are concerned, the most important thing is that you will have a Basically, we are doing it for a pupillary block. So uh, ND YAG iridotomy is done to relieve a pupillary block. And as you can see, this is an iris pombe. So whenever the pupil is blocked here, there is a going forward because the aqueous is trapped behind. And then you want to make a hole over here to get that aqueous out and make the chamber deep. So classically, it is done in acute angle closure primary angle closure suspect, primary angle closure, fellow eye of all these uh, cases, pigment dispersion, mixed glaucoma where we want to do an ALT or SLT to, so to widen the angle, we may have to do it. And even in places of platyoiris, we will have to do it. So the most important thing is primary angle closure suspect, which by definition actually means that the one uh, almost, 180 to 270 degrees of posterior trabecular meshwork cannot be visualized. Now, when you use an indentation gonioscope, you press it down and the fluid flows in the periphery and the angles open up normally. So that you know that this is a primary angle closure suspect. If there is a peripheral anterior synecate, despite you're doing this thing, you know it's a primary angle closure. So in all both these cases, there is a normal disc, normal field, and intraocular pressure may be normal in primary angle closure suspect. But in a primary angle closure, there is a synechia formation and there will be elevation of pressure, but the disc and field will still be normal, which will be abnormal in a primary angle closure glaucoma. We do know that the PI alters course favorably. There are a number of papers, one from our from a very popular Dr. Pandak from PGI, who has clearly shown that if you do a peripheral iridotomy, the chances of PACS converting to PAC to PACG are definitely reduced. But what is the problem? The problem is that PACS is so common. Almost one in eight patients over 40 years of age may be having this situation. 
there is no way you are you will be able to do peripheral eye dot me what these thousands and thousands of people so where should we do it so we decided that, all right we have done a gonioscopy we find it's a primary angle closure suspect now if there is a family history of angle closure if the patient is one eyed if the patient will need repeated dilation if there is a history of iop elevation or the fellow eye is the one in which there is already acute tac or a pac or a chronic acd or one of our tests the tests are not reliable at all but still if the prone dark room test is positive if your anterior segment oc uh, shows that something is not right or the patient is likely to be lost to follow in these situations we will prefer to do a iridotomy and as i will show you the complications you will realize that if a patient has just come to you totally normal he has just come uh, for a routine check up and then you do and you see oh it's a pas let me do a pi and later the patient starts developing a high pressure or a cataract or some other complication then you have converted a normal person into an abnormal person so that is why we have to be very careful we just cannot think of doing a pi in all kind of situations and obviously i told you in primary angle closure glaucoma we may have to do it but what about chronic angle closure glaucoma now if there is a component of pupillary block yes you have to do it but if it the entire angle is closed then you do an iridotomy you are only releasing further pigment which is going to block the mesh flow further compromise the outflow further and the pressure may further get elevated which we don't want obviously in plateau iris the first step is to do a iridotomy again the contraindications basically mean that you will not do it in nvg in cases unless it's a very very urgent thing then you might use an argon but by and large it will bleed so you avoid it please remember non pupillary block mechanisms do not do a pi there is a very common thing now topoimmunate induced uh, bilateral acute acg in which there is a high myopia young males taking antidepressants the cause is choroidal swelling so wherever the cause is choroidal swelling like is sometimes reaction to sulfas etc the pi is not going to help you again lens induced narrowing etc these are not the ones which have to be done by a peripheral iridotomy so be careful about that when you are going to do a iridotomy control the intraocular pressure consent is very very important seems like a small procedure it is not please rule out the use of anticoagulants if the patient is on anticoagulants you have to tell uh, him to go back it may be a cardiologist neurologist whoever they will have to stop the use of anticoagulants for a few days so that we can at least for 5 6 days so that it does not bleed basically we use pilocarpine one drop or maybe two or three drops to stretch out the iris so we can do it easily you must use an abraham's lens which has got a 56 diopter button on one of the edges so that you can concentrate the beam onto the periphery it stabilizes the eye shifts the image periphery and magnifies the image it concentrates the laser and neutralizes the cornea as well now people keep asking me sir kitni energy use karni hai how much energy should be used see if you have a new laser even 3 millijoules may be enough if it is a old laser maybe even 12 will not be enough the idea is that you should be able to complete your iridotomy in 3 to 4 shots if you try and complete in one shot you give a 12 mg new laser shot you may damage the lens underneath you may even subluxate the lens but if instead of that you are using very little power energy what will happen is you will just chip superficially there will be a pigment in the anterior chamber and you won't be able to do anything further so if there is a crypt if you feel it's an easy go down in your energy maybe 4 5 mg may be enough it's a thick iris you may have to use the highest the site normally should not be too peripheral because many times there is an arcus and panus and if you are too peripheral you may hit the ciliary body so it has to be a, a little mid peripheral over here and again 
do not make too big an aridotomy because some people make such big aridotomies and starts acting like a pupil. But now, uh, initially, we used to teach that it has to be covered by the lid. But what is the latest teaching is that wherever the angle is deepest, you are farther away from the cornea, wherever there is a grip, go ahead and do it. The only area is that wherever the lid edge is there, try and avoid that because you can start getting sudden lightning, diplopia, glare, and blurring from post images from that area. And do not go too central like in this case. The size of the iridotomy normally should be around 150 to 200 micron. Don't make too large. What is the end point? You may be asked this question. The end point is sudden deepening of the chamber with gush of aqueous coming out along with a pigment from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber. Retro illumination is not a sure sign. Be sure about that part. Many a times if you have done an iridotomy, you see that still your chamber seems very shallow. You do a gonioscopy, the angle is still almost the same. You can then add on gonioplasty. You can see these small, small spots of gonioplasty where we use a coagulative laser, which I'll tell you later. So we have done a paper on this and it shows that if you are able to open up the angle further, you may even get a lowering of pressure further. So what do you do? Many a times people ask me, sir, this is very thick iris. How will I do this? So if there are no crypts, it's a thick iris. Put pilocarpine two, three times, stretch out the iris. Use multiple sittings, okay? So if you have done one bit, then wait for another one or two hours, let the pigment settle down, then repeat it, and then repeat it, or send back the patient and repeat, okay? Because don't try and complete it in one sitting if it is not possible. Again, what we uh, wrote a paper about was argon-free treatment in which you use large spots, okay? So this is the gonioplasty type of spots in which large, say 300 to 500 micron spot with 0.1 to 0.3 watts. So low power, higher size, and timing of 0.1 to 0.3 seconds. So that we are just creating a superficial chari. We create this all around, so there is a drum head pattern. And the entire iris is stretched. So the central area is very much spread, and you give a high energy shot in the center with a yag and it will suddenly open up. So what, and once you have opened it up and suppose you don't want to use another shot through it because you feel that it may damage the lens below, then you can use the same kind of spots I told you on either side of the iridotomy. And as you can see, it just stretches it open. We must uh, some people like to use pilocarpine post laser for a week to keep the hole stretched and give additional medication. Keep the watching the patient for four hours. That is the time when the peak IOP rise occurs. And uh, steroid antibiotic combination is again given for a week. Keep watching these people and every six months you should repeat gonioscopy. The commonest complication is bleed. This bleed will invariably occur in most of the iridotomies. Uh, you don't have to worry. It seems big through the lens. It is actually very small. If it is occurring, then you can actually press the gonioscope, which will stop the bleed. But sometimes it can be really large. And that is why we said, please check for anticoagulant post, especially if it's a one-eyed patient. If, it is, if already there is a compromised disc, like this was a secondary glaucoma. So all, we had to actually evacuate it later because somebody else did somewhere and the whole eye was filled with blood. So please do checking anticoagulants and checking that there's no blood vessels over there are very important. You can have a sublight hemorrhage and, and retinal bleeds as well because of the high energy if you use. Like I told you, the pressure can go up uh, and the peak usually occurs around four hours. If the disc is compromised, please watch it closely. Okay, so that uh, if it is elevated, you can give even Diamox or Manitol or whatever is required. Don't make it an ego issue that I will complete the iridotomy today. Now, in this case, the patient, the patient was given 200 shots. Can you imagine something which should be completed in four shots? They have given so many shots resulting in choroids, 
edema, macular edema, decrease of vision. Luckily, with topical and oral steroids, it came down, but you should never do that. Use multiple settings. Cornea can also be hit very, very commonly. So that is why please choose not such a peripheral site and you can use a mid-peripheral site and please take the deepest part of the chamber. Why does this corneal injury? Obviously, you can hit it directly. And that is why your setting on the this thing should be either a posterior focal shift or a zero shift so that you are uh, focusing deep in the eyes. And it can be damaged because of thermal damage, mechanical shock waves, release of iris pigments, transient rise of IOP, inflammation setup, turbulent aqueous flow, and so many other things, even bubble settling on can damage the uh, cornea. And this damage has been shown to occur even eight years later also. Again, cataract formation is also a complication which people say do occur. And it may be because of the direct impact because once you have made a hole, you have gone again through it and hit, which can definitely form a cataract. But there is also an overall progression which may not be associated actually with gender, energy delivered, and angle width, etc. So that is why we were saying that we will not like to do PI in everybody offhand. It can even cause lens subluxation, subluxation and dislocation, as we said. Okay, so this part is complete. Uh, Prateep, do we have any questions of PI as yet? No, I don't think so that we have any questions. Okay, this, it has not reached to me. Do you want to clarify any part here for the children? I think we can have a discussion at the end. Okay. No, I was just trying to take a breather. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so, be any questions at this time for peripheral iridotomy because that is the commonest thing that we are doing. No, yeah, so everything is very clear apparently. Okay. Uh, sir. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is one question, uh -huh. but I didn't send because I thought we will send at last. Yeah. One question. Why retroillumination is not a sure sign of patent iridotomy is uh, the very, question very somebody good. had asked. So what happens is that the fibers may be very, very finely distributed and actually, you will see that they are uh, full on. It means they are mm. fully the fi fibers. The last roll of the fibers may still mm. very much be there, but mm. they are so thin that the light will shine through on retro illumination. But actually, the PI is not patent. Mm. And you will get to know because the element of Iris Bombay would not have disappeared. And okay. you will not see the pigment coming forward. So that is why, uh, very good question. I think that is first time somebody has asked me. That is very <laughs> Okay. So, so you tell now that how, how to confirm that it's a full thickness. Yeah. So you can actually do an anterior segment OCT, which will immediately show to you whether it is full thickness. And Prateep, any other way? Uh, no, I think that uh, either UBM or AS OCT is the only way. They will be there. Okay. So let's move on to argon laser trepiculoplasty. This was very popular at one time and initially popularized by Weiss and Witter and still quite popular in some of the countries. So what happens in this is we are using any coagulative laser, classically an argon which is available to most of the people is there in which we use a 50 micron spot 0.1 second uh, 0.8 to 1.2 watt for photocoagulative. Initially, we go inferiorly in the angle with a uh, with a uh, coated anti-reflected uh, laser coated uh, goni or a rich lens, and the idea is to hit it in the area of the anterior trabecular meshwork. Okay, so what basically uh, and it is much more affected in the pigmented eyes less affected in secondary glaucomas. Classically, it decreases the pressure by around three to eight millimeters. The pressure lowering does not last very long, especially in Indian eyes. It may last for three months, it may last for six months, it may last for a year, some lucky, it may last for a longer time. 
but that is why it's more like a temporary phenomenon. So some of the patients who just don't want to use drugs and are fresh can be tried. Uh, it can classically be used in therapeutic crossroad, means the patient is in full medical therapy, but uh, he is not fit for surgery, so we want to delay everything, but the patient doesn't want surgery, then we can get some lowering by this. Suppose, very important, pregnancy, where none of the drugs is safe, we can lower the pressure by this for steroid-induced glaucoma, where we know that we have taken out the depot and things will settle down. There you can use this. So these, any temporary situations, it is a very good option. But now what has become much more popular is the SNT, popularized by Latina and Parks in 95. Uh, so here there is a frequency doubled NDA targeting pigment trabecular cells. So it is a specialized laser. It's not a routine laser. It requires a specialized machine costing around 26 lakhs. The advantage of SLT over ALT is that SLT has a large spot, 400 microns. You can just throw it in the angle and just there's no need to really focus too much. Around 50 spots are required. The energy is less than 1% of ALT. So that is very, very good. And we can do multiple settings without being worried about the thermal damage. Every patient who goes to the West invariably gets, they're really fond of this uh, SLT. However, in Indian eyes, I can again tell you, yes, uh, we have a number of people who are doing it regularly, but the indications are the same because it may not last very long, especially in Indian eyes. Uh, somebody may ask you, how does it work? So it's a selective photothermiolysis where there are very small pulses given and which is uh, specifically affecting the chromophore melanin, including cells. And that is why uh, it is much easier. So what basically these two things are doing is that they are triggering macrophages to remove dam damaged trabecular meshwork cells that will improve the flow. Surrounding trabecular meshwork cells divide to replace lost cells. And that is why the flow may be restored. So that is an advantage that that is the one of the thought process by which it ALT and SLT work. You must avoid post-operatively steroids and NSAIDs, which can blunt the response. So somebody may ask you, what are the indications of doing an ALT and SLT? What lasers are used for ALT and SLT? What is the basic difference between these two procedures and pre and post-op uh, regimens? And where do you aim the spots? Then we come on to argon laser peripheral iridoplasty, also known as gonioplasty. Like I have been telling you all along, the coagulative laser, that is argon, krypton, frequency doubled, NDAG, which is 532 nanometer, P green laser. You give a large spot size over here, say around 300 to 500 microns. So there is a large spot, the power is low, 0.1 to 0.3 watts, and uh, timing is around 0.1 to 0.3 watts again. So the idea is you are doing a superficial charring. Whenever you are hitting it, and if there's a pigment release, means you are overpowered. So you will go low on the power or increase the size, which will do the same work of decreasing the power. And the idea is that whenever there is superficial charring, the iris will be pulled open and the angle will open. If suppose there is a peripheral anterior synechia and the angle is not opening, then you will see that the pupil will start moving because you have been pulling on either side. So though it is far away, but since this cannot open, this will open. So be careful about when you are doing it. So you can either use a lens or you can just do it without it. So this is just a procedure to show you. And the spot size, one usually does all 360 degrees and you separate it out with one spot size each. And you can do it either this way or you can do it uh, with the help of a, so you can do it directly or you can do it through a gonioscope as well. So classically, the indication, if you are asked, what is the indication is classically the plateau iris. You can also do it in cases of mixed glaucoma where you want to open up the angle to do further ALT or SLT. 
And uh, like I already told you in chronic angle shoulder, when you've done a PI, but you want further lowering of the pressure, again, there you can do it. Acute angle closure attack can be broken by this. And temporary IOP lowering in lens-induced glaucoma and topimerate-induced glaucoma, where you do not do a PI, is also possible by glomeroplasty. So the, basically what happens in, in a plateau iris, we always first do an aridotomy. But then once we dilate, we realize oh, there is a double hump pattern and there is a, so what basically is happening over here is that the angle is, uh, the angle is, the moment you dilate, the whole thing goes and covers up the trabecular mesh bar. So you have to flatten out this iris over here so that it doesn't go and touch it like this and it can remain open. So this is the pre and once you do, you see the angle opens up. Again, on anti-segment OCT, you can see a shallow 28 degrees goes to almost 40 degrees once we have put the spots over here. One of the most important things is using acute angle closure clock. So we had this 52-year female pressure 48, not responding to any medication, not responding to mannitol, dimox, anything. We tried strong light, central thumb pressure, short of doing a parasynthesis, which I personally don't like, but some people do it. So we thought what to do in this case. You can see the pupil is mid-dilated. There's no way in this boggy iris you can do an iridotomy. And suddenly I realized that Dr. Lamb and Robert Rich both have said that this is a possibility. So we did uh, uh, this uh, procedure, gonioplasty all along, and within half an hour, the whole thing was controlled. So this is something that you must remember and could be useful because you don't lose. There's hardly any side effect to this ALPI. And uh, there are a number of papers based on this. ALPI may be a better choice for rapidly lowering the IOP in patients with acute primary angle closure in a short period. Dr. Ramakrishna has done a number of uh, cases and he's also shown that both in plateau iris and synechial angle closure, Peripheral iridoplasty can be very effective in opening the angle and it is quite safe. And the same things are, are done here. So uh, this I already told you, it can also be used in intubescent lens uh, and in topimerate induced angle closure. In, uh, uh, like we were talking about the plateau iris, so in this kind of situation, uh, Post-operatively, obviously, you use uh, steroid uh, drops and pilocarpine is to be put pre-operatively and post-operatively also to keep the angle stretched. If the, you do a gonioscopy later, if you find that the IOP is normal, angle opening is achieved, you just follow six monthly. If it is not, if the IOP is going higher, then you can add medications, but later even trab or a legs extraction may be required. The side effects are usually, it's very safe. I've done thousands and thousands, nothing happens really. But yes, theoretically, there could be a pupillary dilation, uretazavalia, prolonged pupillary enlargement with glare may occur. And this is one of my patients in which also I found that there's some deep pigmentation over after many years. So uh, the question on this would be, how would you diagnose a plateau iris? What all lasers can you use for doing iridoplasty? What are all the indications for which one can do it? What are the settings on lasers and how to do it? Again, very important thing is dealing with malignant glaucoma. God forbid, but the moment you see a case of malignant glaucoma, you will be sweating because there's a shallow chamber, extremely high pressure, and many a times, God forbid, you may have done some surgery after which it may occur. So how can we use a laser to deal with malignant glaucoma? What is the purpose of the laser here? Can it be done in all situations in malignant glaucoma? So what happens in malignant glaucoma? There's an anterior rotation of the ciliary body. So the aqueous actually starts percolating behind. And <clears throat> there is a slackness of zonules, ciliario lenticular or ciliovitreal block may occur because of this misdirection of the echo, so they are trapped behind in pockets. Now, if there is a normal lens over there, uh, it's a fake patient, we can't use lasers. Then you will have to use medications, and anyway, we all use atropine, et cetera, to begin with. If it doesn't work and the patient doesn't have, a, if he has a fakia or pseudo fakia, in that situation, 
we will go in and cut the anterior hyoid and cut these pockets to release the aphthous. <coughs> so we call it ND YAG laser anterior hyaloidotomy or ND YAG laser vitreolysis. So basically use, you use a capsulotomy lens, settings may be two to five millijoules, go through the pupil or a patent iridotomy. And what you are trying to do is you are going to release those pockets inside. Obviously, it's a blind procedure. So you just hit in the middle of the vitreous and you hope that they break open. If there's a posterior capsule, you have to cut that also because the fluid is released, but it can't come forward. So you cut it right till the edge of the lens so that the fluid coming out will come throughout the edge and come like this. And then you will see that something which is as shallow as this suddenly becomes deep. So it's a very useful procedure in malignant glaucoma. If this doesn't work, then you'll have to go for doing the vitrectomy. Another very, very important case, which I'm showing only to show you that you must do out of the box thinking. You are all young and you must not only get, oh, this is what to do for this patient. Think what to do for this patient and try and see what new can be done, not only what is given in the books. So this young female came to us, the other eye was lost, bilateral uveitis, the pupil is stuck up, multiple iridotomies have been failing, the pressure is high, there is a posterior subcapsular cataract, the vision is down and the patient is crying, crying, and we are very, very worried. So I thought and I thought and I thought, what should I do? So what I uh, thought was that let me dilate it and with very low energy of 2 millijoules or 0.5 to 2 millijoules, put a beam over here, which is not touching the lens, but as there is a plasma formation, it will break the synechia. And you do multiple sittings starting inferiorly because invariably the synechia bleed. So once you are doing here, the bleed goes down and you can keep doing on either side. And what happens is that this stuck up pupil opens up. So I can never forget the smile of that girl who was who escaped surgery and she didn't want surgery because the other eye was already lost. She regained almost 618 vision from either side because the posterior subcapsular cataract was bypassed and the pupil opened up. And since the pupil opened up, there was no need for an iridotomy because the aqueous could go from here and go to the periphery. But yes, with modern surgery, we usually do surgery in these cases, but you must remember the idea of my telling you this was that think of something new. This procedure has never been tried in the world anywhere else and it got later mentioned in Shields textbook as well. So it, you have to think of something new all the time. So again, same thing, you can see how it opens up like this. Again, many a times what happens is you have done a releasable suture, the suture breaks, you can't open up the thing and the trap is failing. So you just put uh, some tropicamide plus so that the, this thing gets blanched. Use a Hoskins lens to visualize the suture and use 50 microns, smallest spot and a large power of around one watt and you can cut it. Uh, uh, immediately and then you can just do a massage and the whole blep will leave. <coughs> Again, there is a situation where uh, there's huge blep formation. The chamber is getting shallow, patient is hypotonic, macular edema, cosmetic blemish is there, the vision is going down. So you can obviously take the patient into the OT and you can either do these kind of sutures or you can revise your internal bleb and all that. But short of it, we thought, can we do something in the OPD itself? So we painted this by gentian boilet and then used these large spot size to create a barrier over here. So the simple thing, again, the same thing, large spot size and low power in order to just give these spots over here so that a barrier is created, these things will scar up and a barrier will be created over here. So once you do like that, you can see that the entire fluid from the barrier has been absorbed ultimately. 
and the, the entire choroid actually got settled. The same thing you can use if there's a large pleb over here, you can flatten it by a similar procedure. Now we come to another procedure which is actually very commonly used Everywhere people do use cyclocryo because that is an easy machine, 5-8 thousand it costs you, but it is a painful procedure. We are using cyclocryo in the same way, but now we use diode laser cyclophotocoagulation wherever it is available. Initially, we used to use it as a last resort, but now currently it has been started using in seeing eyes as well if you do it in a phased manner, very carefully. So the questions can be, what lasers can be used for cyclophotocoagulation? How different from cyclocryo? Where all this procedure can be done? How safe is it? Can we do them in seeing eyes? What are the possible complications? So these are the questions that can be asked. So where do we do it? Neovascular glaucoma post-penetrating PK glaucoma, post-traumatic glaucoma, basically any kind of refractory glaucoma in which surgery is not possible or there are failed multiple surgeries or the patient cannot undergo surgery because of a systemic problem or there is a, you want a pain relief in a painful blind eye or in some of the African continents where surgeons were not available. Anybody can be taught to do this and they saved a whole lot of eyes over there. So this all must be remembered. The mechanism of action is that the laser is focused on the ciliary body. So it causes a destruction of the ciliary epithelium resulting in decreased aqueous production. This <clears throat> destruction of the ciliary blood vessels so that the aqueous doesn't get formed. There could be inflammation and there was an element of cyclodialysis and increased uvus turtle outflow as well. So classically we use, there are various companies which give this. The basic power is around 1200 to 1800 milliwatt uh, with a 2000 millisecond uh, duration and 1000 millisecond re and this, uh, repetition. Four to six spots per quadrant are given. And the spots are separated out by one or a half bit of the G4. And uh, <clears throat> normally what we do is the moment we hear a pop sound, we reduce the power by around 100 to 200 uh, milliwatts. And that is the power that we then use all around. Classically, you should use transcleral uh, illumination in order to find out where the ciliary body is located. Because many a times it is very variable. So you may be doing it at a totally wrong place. So <clears throat> must and you must avoid sites of previous filtering surgery or tubes, areas of thin sclera and three or nine o'clock positions to avoid long posterior ciliary nerves. Uh, obviously, once you have done the laser, you still give uh, cyclopylidic, all the pre-laser glaucoma medications till you are showed that the pressure becomes okay, topical antibiotic steroids for a week and very strong analgesics because patients will have pain. And if you have to do additional laser therapy, if suppose it's a seeing eye, you do in a maybe you just do one quadrant or two quadrants and tell them that yes, maybe we'll have to require it to do it later as well, but not earlier than four to six weeks. So this is how we keep the probe over here and the rest I have told you how we do it. The complications are very, very important. You must get a good written consent because there is a risk of thysis. You must tell the patient that the vision may be completely lost. There could be staphyloma, pupillary distortion, vitreous hemorrhage, cataract formulation, high intra uh, formation, high intraocular pressure, corneal edema, what not, and even sometimes the eye may become painful. So all these must be explained to the patient clearly. We now have a laser which is very popular, which was known as the micropulse laser. Why I initially got bugged was because the people were selling it and buying it because they thought they could, it is a substitute for trabeculate. Definitely it is not but it has its own good points. So one must know for each procedure, what are the good points and use it accordingly. Instead of using it 
for a situation where it is not to be used for. So this is a new type of a diode laser, cyclo G6 or a micropulse, 810 diode, uh, this thing diode laser. Uh, basically, Aritex, uh, this thing is giving it. And uh, so it has an on time and an off time. So because of the off time, the target tissues get cooled. And they say that also they increase the uveoscleral outflow. So it is not only damaging the uh, silvi body in a way, but it is also doing other ways in which to open up. So, but uh, it works well for some time. I've seen now enough patients to know that it can cause hypotony, failure to reduce pressure, pupillary dilatation, bleeds, detachments, and so many things. So when you are doing in seeing eyes, please get a clear consent that I'm doing it because uh, it is difficult to do other procedures. And uh, I may have to do even further additional surgery or repeat of the same procedure uh, because in some it may work well, but many patients you may require going on to trabeculectomy or other procedures. So this is one of the patients which was referred to me, which had now, now I did a trap, but it, it was a young male in both eyes. They did a micro pulse and it, there was a, a dilatation of the pupil and the pressure could not get controlled. There was another patient with hemorrhage. So there can be problems but it can work well as well. So especially many of the situations where nothing else is working, micropulse, I think, is a better option than going for a diode. Then there is a technique of endocyclophotocoagulation made in which, again, a diode laser is used with a variable xenon light source, a helium-neon laser aiming beam, and a video camera all in one. So what you do is you put endoscopic diode laser and we just show you, yeah, that's what. So this is how you see, and these are the probes, and you just uh, ablate the silvery body. So they don't even ablate the silvery body, plus also they push back the iris or flatten the iris to open up the angles as well. And normally these are used post in cataract surgery because they can be used uh, together. So if a patient with glaucoma Having a cataract surgery, you don't want to do a trabeculectomy. You can do endocyclophotocoagulation and you can get good results. But you have to be clear that there could be fibrin exudation, hyphema, CME, etc. along with choroidal detachment. So one must be careful. This is a, a manual uh, deep penetrating sclerectomy, almost impossible to do. Very few people are capable of raising this deep scleral flap to deroot the Schlem's canal. The beauty of this procedure as a as a adjunct to trabeculectomy, not doing trabeculectomy, is that you are not in connection with the chamber. Only the deeper pockets are here, so that there is no connection, and yet the fluid is leaking through this. So it is. So they, the Israelis developed this machine known as Aptimate Carbon Dioxide Laser System in which uh, a CO2 laser was used and the beam of 1 to 40 watts is tagged along with a helium neon beam to give it color. The moment uh, the CO2 laser encounters water, it does not act further. So the beauty was that you do a standard trabeculectomy and uh, then what happens is then you start giving these spots, okay? So you give these spots and sooner uh, this, uh, you can see the Schlem's canal gets de -root. The moment the Schlem canals get de and the fluid comes out through it, then this laser stops working at that point. And that is how you get, that is how you get these plebs. So the problem is that these blebs are not as good as trabeculectomy because still one layer is left, okay? So that uh, part of the Schleim's canal is, the inner part is still left. So the fluid is not leaking freely. And yet, the beauty is that you have not entered the anterior chamber, you have not done the peripheral iotomy. So in one-eyed patients, advanced glaucoma, they don't want any chances of infection. And uh, so... In all these situations, if rarely you have to do inferior sites, which we normally don't do in trabeculectomy, you can do this surgery. 
if you have missed anything, we have a review article in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology 2018. This is the context in which we have given a review on lasers in glaucoma where you can go back and get it. In the end, I want to tell you, use everything with caution. Get all aspects of a procedure. Many people will come, oh, this is very good. Try this, try this. Sure, you try this with an open mind. Do not listen to anybody. Do not think that one paper on one subject has come and you, oh my God, this is good. It does not. Don't love or hate it. Just use it for its science. Think new. Try and do something. But don't believe in all publication. Look at all and judge yourself. And thank you very much for your kind care. Wow. Thank you very much, Dr. Harsh. It was a wonderful lecture and every word you said uh, in the lecture, uh, you know, is uh, really a sacrosanct uh, word. The simple reason is that, you know, you have not avoided Padanchi like that. You are the only one glaucoma expert in the country who has been awarded Padamshi. So that is, that is why the reason is this. Uh, you, you have dealt this topic wonderfully, excellent, superb. So just a few points uh, I would like to make, you know, the most commonly performed laser procedure in glaucoma is the YAG laser peripheral iridotomy. So remember a couple of points, you know, never ever do the PI without constricting the pupil. Some pupil, some doctor may tell you that, okay, they can get away without constricting the pupil, but it's very difficult very, very difficult and don't indulge yourself into that kind of a practice and always put the lens. There are many people I have seen that they do the iridotomy without putting up the lens. Regarding the indication, yes, it's always a uh, little difficult. Uh, you know, uh, if you do the PI, then also there is no guarantee that the patient will not land up in an angle for the glaucoma. There are many patients who lands up in the angle for the glaucoma. But yes, uh, you can save almost all the patients from lending up in the acute angle closer glaucoma. If you don't do the PI, then there is always a problem. So you have to debate that what is more beneficial. And I always go by the, uh, the monograph of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, which says that the YAC peripheral hydrotomy is a non-invasive procedure. A very safe procedure. Obviously, as Dr. Hirsch mentioned, that it has a several uh, side effects and the complication, but it's still it's a very safe procedure. So you can be a little liberal uh, while doing or uh, selecting the patient for the YAG laser peripheral iridotomy. And I do not have a data to share with you, but I can tell you with the guarantee that you know I'm seeing almost 20 odd patients of glaucoma every day. And the number of acute angle flows of glaucoma in our practice has substantially reduced in last decade or so. And that is only and only because of the like, peripheral aridotomy. If it's overdone, then also it's okay because you are saving so many uh, people going uh, into the blindness because of the angle flows of glaucoma. So that is one point. But regarding the ASLT and ALT, yes, there is a too much of hype these days. The people, they keep on talking up the, about the SLT, that SLT is very, very useful. Uh, I have used the SLT way back in 2000, and I can tell you that, you know, uh, it does not work for a very prolonged period. Harsh also has mentioned that, you know, it does not work for a very prolonged period. And you cannot trust that each and every patient of yours will respond. And if they will respond, then how much lowering of the IOP you will have, you cannot predict. It's impossible. It's very, very difficult. So yes, it's reserve only and only for a chosen few or a selected few patients where otherwise uh, you do not want to give a medical therapy or the compliance is a factor or they just have ocular hypertension or they have some systemic problem or intolerance to drug and you want to defer the surgery or you have done the surgery but still the IOP is not controlled and you want to defer a repeat surgery for a while then definitely in these selected few patients, you can try SLT or ALT. But otherwise, it's very expensive machine and uh, it does not give that much of result. Regarding 
the uh, the iridoplasty dr harsh has done extensive research on that and uh, he is authority on that uh, we have a limited experience but we do in plateau uh, iris syndrome in some of the patient you know but uh, you can count the number on the fingers i might not be doing uh, more than 5 to 10 procedure in a year time so he has much more experience than us but uh, i can only tell you that it works and in some of the patient it really delivers a wonder particularly in a acute angle fusor glaucoma you clear up the cornea and you do the iridoplasty and it pulls up the iris and it opens up the angle in many of the patients the sutureolysis is again a wonderful procedure and uh, if you are not trained for uh, for putting up the releasable suture then you have a very good uh, things in your armamentarium uh, to treat the immediate uh, uh, post of failure of the blem it is a very very good thing and there are so many other procedure which uh, he is the only one who has performed like uh, treating the various kinds of blem uh, which we do not have much experience you know Uh, for couple of uh, overhanging blab i did try uh, but uh, it works only with the, uh, the experienced hand and it may not work but uh, never leave give up the hope and uh, try it out hopefully you will be uh, as successful as dr harsh is uh, regarding the tscpc and uh, the micropulse laser uh, they are very useful in your practice particularly the tscpc or dlcp in those patients uh, who have a painful blind eye it is a wonderful procedure remember that at least it will bring down the pressure uh, so that the patient can live a comfortable life hypotonia is always a, a risk but these blind eyes the patient they tolerate it very well and they accept it very well so there is no no uh, uh, much crib about uh, the eyes going into thysis uh, by these patients regarding uh, some uh, other procedures the endo laser cyclophotocoagulation and all i do not have much experience and uh, uh, it's very difficult that is not for the uh, post graduate students and the uh, glaucomatologist who have just started their practice but uh, it can deliver a wonders uh, in the experience hand so in nutshell it was a wonderful lecture and yes covered every every single possible thing related to laser in glaucoma thank you dr harsh and uh, we have some questions prateep so can yes uh, there are some questions for you I dr harsh uh, piyushi she has really uh, asked something which i later add to my lecture because students ask always newer things and we can add on to the lecture <laughs> i do it immediately <laughs> thank you piyushi for asking one patient painted after peripheral eye dot Yes, <laughs> so actually make fun also, but <laughs> but the truth is, and very nicely said. You know what happens is that there is a sudden lowering of pressure. The moment there is a sudden lowering, the moment you do an iridotomy, and if there is an iris bombay, especially in secondary glaucoma types, there may be a sudden lowering of pressure from forty to uh, just ten uh, or something, and they have a sudden headache and they have a sudden funny feeling. and some of them may just fail so that is very right yeah the other mechanism you know there is a known mechanism uh, is a pupillary vasovagal i don't know whether you have experienced in your practice but even the acceleration tonometry uh, can cause the vasovagal uh, attack uh, you know uh, that is all related to the pupillary mechanism the afferent goes from the pupil and once you hit the iris uh in some of the patient if they are sensitive and they are prone for that then there is a risk of uh, going into the vasovagal and then you don't have any other uh, way to accept to resuscitate them as early as possible yeah so just make them lie down and keep the foot yeah the cpr is must everyone knows uh, how to perform the <laughs> cpr so ideally you know many a times these laser procedures they uh, sound same simple but like pratip said it is better if you are lucky to have an anesthetist somewhere around you so at least uh, you will have a safety yeah the second thing tripti has asked is will it not lead to dry as we are putting laser marks on the conjunctiva in yes degree blab spread so i want to tell you tripti we are putting the laser marks only on one or two sides so uh, it is not that we are putting it 360 degrees we are putting it only one side and uh, making it uh, 
making it to uh, come over there so that there's a stretch over there. So three things, and uh, uh, the dryness would occur if you are dealing with, uh, yes, and the question is good because in some of the situations uh, of DLCP, et cetera, there where we are actually destroying the, some of the areas around that, uh, which may be a larger area to be destroyed, but the, as we know, the stem cells are within one to 1.5 millimeters of the corneal limbal area. So uh, that is the area which one has to spread out, spare out. Pratim, any uh, other uh, thoughts on that? No, what I personally feel, I personally... Uh, may I ask something, sir? Yeah, Kanika. Yes, Kanika. Uh, so just a curious question. Uh, so have you used argon laser iridoplasty in pigment dispersion? I mean, I am referring to the patients who have not yet gone into pigmentary glaucoma and have that posterior bowing or convexity, which is uh, which is rubbing the iris mechanically to the lens. So have you ever tried uh, the iridoplasty in those to alter the uh, bowing of the iris, sir? Actually, Karika, because uh, we maybe whatever we are doing with the iridoplasty is only going to take care of the peripheral part. But uh, yes. it is, this is actually rubbing on the entire lens. So obviously, okay. uh, the areas which are rubbing on that uh, periphery may be uh, cured. And even doing an iridotomy is now not a sure thing because some people do it, some people don't do it. So frankly speaking, it's a very uh, controversial topic. So uh, okay. Pratip, what is your thought? Yeah, absolutely. You know, in, in, in the pigmentary dispersion syndrome, uh, irido, doing the iridoplasty is not at all a good thing because, you know, the pigment is so loosely attached to, to entire iris. And if you will put so many spots over the circumference of the iris, then it would cause more of a pigment release rather than pushing out the iris from the, the angle. And the objective of this treatment is not to pull out the iris from the angle. It is just to, to release the pressure in the posterior chamber. So that, the, from, sorry, the anterior chamber. So that purpose will not be served anyway uh, by doing the peripheral iridoplasty. So the thinking of the peripheral iridoplasty in the pigmentary dispersion syndrome, uh, in place of iridotomy, uh, I don't think that it would serve any purpose. I think Dr. Veer is raising the hand. Dr. Veer, do you have any question to ask? Okay, so probably it is inadvertently. Somebody somebody has asked about the, the, do you change any protocol of the SLT in the PDS anti dispersion syndrome? Hello. Less number of spots. Good and... evening, sir. Yes, Christy. Sir, I'm okay. Yes, Christy. Okay. Is... Yes, sir. Sir, I'm sir, I'm Dr. Christy. I'm Dr. Santos Honavers fellow. Yeah. Sir, can you please tell me your affiliation, sir, for tomorrow's program? I just want to write it down. Your affiliation, sir, the current, the current hospital which you are working, sir. You are asking to whom, Christy? Christy current I... affiliation, sir. Christy, but to whom? The hospital or institute you are working, sir. Christy, please put off. I think you are talking to somebody else, and you are. Yes, ah. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, so you, yeah. <laughs> You go on mute, yes, sir. Christy. Please mute yourself. Mm. Okay. So, Prati. Uh, mm. So, the PDS, yes. Christy, you mute yourself. Mute yeah. yourself. No, no, no. Sir, which hospital you're working right now, sir? No, Christy, you mute yourself you're, because you are not asking this question to Dr. Uh, Harshan. Admin, please. can you please mute? Uh, which natural is I did not. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, yes, 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 sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Anyway, uh, Pratik, sir, I'm doing my fellowship under Dr. Santosh. My God. Oh, admin, can you can Thank you, you mute Christy? Can you, you mute Christy, please? Sir. Ah. Admin, where is the admin? Okay. Admin, hmm. can you mute Christy? Hmm. Rolika, can you can you give a call to Christy and ask? Okay, she's muted now. Yes, Dr. Harsh. So we were talking about the, the uh, pigmentary dispersion syndrome and the SLT. So, yeah. So the question is that, uh, frankly speaking, like Pratip was saying, I actually have given up doing SLT for a long time now. So I really would be, it will be difficult for me to directly say, but yes, pigment dispersion again 
it will work better because they pick up the things better and uh, it, it they may act better but frankly speaking i am not doing it anymore uh, there there are some people who regularly use it uh, what is your thought prateep no no the the only problem you know the release of the pigment is a continuum so once you have done the slt the pigment will be washed out the pressure will go down but again there will be a release of pigments and that again uh, uh, yeah. yeah so again the pressure will go up so it will last for a short time yeah and that anyway is a process which lasts for a very short time so and especially in indian eyes i've seen it really doesn't work very well it works well in some situations but anyway any other questions yeah yeah one more question was uh, regarding the capsular distended syndrome that you know how would you treat uh, the capsular distended syndrome with the yag laser so that is basically for the cataract surgeon you just just put a couple of uh, spots in the posterior capsule and and the aqueous will go away uh, so this fine can I, can laser scan capsular distended What do you want to do with anaerobia? Oh, uh, actually, <laughs> so no, I think what they mean to say is glaucoma associated with anaerobia, but those angles are very bad. Yeah, it's all rudimentary iris blocking right. the angle, so mm. it doesn't work there at all. There's no question. One shouldn't even try. Even the surgeries uh, tend to fail. But so, but but uh, but you know, endo lasers. Uh, yeah, endo lasers. You see, yes. That is that can be performed very comfortably in these eyes, but then and, you have to choose whether you want to do a tube or an endo laser because again endo laser would be a destructive thing. Yes, so possibly one would choose between these two, but I think that is way beyond the PG thing. <laughs> it is something quite. Yeah, but even different. even the trabecular to be works in these eyes. Ah, huh, it works, but that is the first choice instead of doing any laser to begin with. So that's about it. Yeah, so that was wonderful. Uh, so we are enjoyed thoroughly. Good. Every time when when I hear your lecture on the lasers, I learn so something. From the students and you also. So <laughs> we'll add on that to the next lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Doctor. Yeah. Yeah. So if there is no further question, okay, we will call it a day. Thank you, everybody, for Thank attending. Thank you. Thank you, Harsh, for a wonderful lecture, and thanks everyone for attending this. I could not let me see that there might be Thank some you, question. Can laser help? Thank you, sir. No. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Rolika. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs>